In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. I had a teacher in seminary who would always emphasize the difference between teaching and preaching. He'd say, when you're in your role as a priest, you have to do both. You have to teach. People need to hear the content of what the gospel is. They need to hear what the church teaches us on how to live and what's right and what's wrong. But he said that's different from preaching. Preaching is not necessarily the what. Preaching is encouraging the people to do it. So every sermon is about encouraging you, and among you I include myself, by the way. I don't preach a sermon that I don't need to hear myself. What we all need to hear and the inspiration to change. And change, as we've talked about many times, is very tough. Today I want to take a different uh, topic and not encourage you to think about what the gospel is or even encourage you to change I want you to take a step back even farther and think about why we make the decisions we make why we do certain things or don't do certain things I want to look at our decision making some of you might remember the name Lawrence Kohlberg I remember that name from my early psychology classes in college some of you younger ones you're going to hear his name at some point Lawrence Kohlberg looked at what he called moral reasoning and he tried to figure out what is it what is the structure what is the method by which we decide what's right and wrong and then what we're going to do about it what he came up is that there are actually in his words three levels of our moral reasoning now he called these pre-conventional conventional post-conventional no he was not talking about hosting a convention He was talking about the convention of knowing who I am, knowing my place in the world around me. That's what he called conventional. So for the pre-conventional, what he said, he called this level one, this is what he said most kids are in the middle of as they're developing in their young lives. And at each level, by the way, there's two sub-levels. Sub-level one in level one is what he called obedience and punishment. We make a decision on what's right and wrong, what I'm going to do or not do, based on am I going to get punished or am I going to get rewarded. He said that was the lowest level of moral reasoning there is. Obedience and punishment. He said right next to that, but still in level one, pre-conventional, he said is self-interest orientation. In other words, what's in it for me? If I might get rewarded or be seen as being a better person for doing it, that might motivate me to do the right thing. Then he said level two, conventional, this is where most, some kids and some adolescents are, he said interpersonal accord and conformity. In other words, what's the norm among our group? What do we all consider to be right and wrong? And because it's right and wrong, I'm gonna try to do it. Then a little bit higher than that, he called authority and social order. What's the law say? The law becomes valuable. Level three, very quickly, social contract. What do we, not just as a a community, but what's what's the whole world say at level five and then six? What does the universe say? So all these things, I'm not going to quiz you on it. Don't worry about memorizing them. They go from a very low level of moral reasoning, punishment, reward, to what he considered the highest level there was, that there's some worldwide agreement on what is ethically right and wrong well I think if we think about this in an earthly sense perhaps that's as far as you can go whatever morals the whole world might agree on that might be the highest we attain to as a people and as a race but we are invited not to just live as citizens of this world but as citizens of another kingdom currently on pilgrimage in this world. And that's what today's readings invite us to do. They invite us to go past all six levels and their sub-levels to ascend to what I'm going to call level seven. And that's what we heard about in today's readings. Let's look first at the gospel. The gospel is an example of what we do not when we're in the middle of moral reasoning, but avoid it altogether. It's one of Jesus' shortest parables. A man had a rich harvest, 
ran out of room, thought to himself, what's he going to do? I know what to do. I'll build bigger barns. He builds bigger barns. And that night, the Lord says to him, you fool, this night your life is required of you and your things, who are they going to be? This tells us what we what happens to us when we avoid moral reason, when we think only about ourselves. There's no consideration for anyone else, let alone a universal set of principles. It's just about us. And what we learn, by the way, is that that's a dead end road. Now, I don't know about you, but I found that a little convicting. If you think about all the time and effort and focus we put into what we're going to put into our barns. Think about all the retirement planning and the budgeting and all that. All that, what goes in our barns? And he says, fool, this night your soul has required you of these things. Whose are they going to be? So that's a no, that's a dead end road, literally a dead end road. The epistle has something even more interesting to say, I think, on this topic. Now, I'm not going to go too far in the background because it's a little bit complicated, but suffice it to say that there was a problem in the early Christian church. And some of the Christian leaders were saying you had to go through circumcision to join the Christian church. Why? Because they were Jews, and to be a Jew, you had to be circumcised. And there was this controversy back and forth that St. Paul talks about a lot. It's not, though, about circumcision. It's about what do we have to adhere to? And in that is where St. Paul says something very, very important that's at the heart of what I want to share with you today. He talks about some levels of moral reasoning. He criticizes them for saying they don't have to be part of that community. Then he says something absolutely vital. He says, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision counts for anything. That would have been scandalous, by the way, to a, to a Jew hearing that. But here's the key point. He says, neither circumcision counts for anything or, or, or uncircumcision, but, he says, a new creation. A new creation. That's what counts. doesn't matter if you're circumcised or not. What matters is a new creation. We're going to get back to that new creation in a few minutes. Let's go back to this moral reasoning for a bit. When I was studying Kohlberg back in the late 80s, we were taught that most people never make it past the conventional level, sub-level four. In other words, people don't make it past a moral thinking, thinking based on law and order. Most people, adults, Kohlberg told us, don't attain a social contract level of moral reasoning. In other words, at least back in the 80s, what he was saying is most people don't grow up in terms of their moral reasoning. But then I looked at it a little more recently. What I found out was a little disturbing. We're actually going backwards. We as a society are not advancing in our moral reasoning. We're retreating. And where law and order used to matter much more, even though it wasn't complete maturity in adulthood, now what we're finding out is more and more adults live at level one. How can I avoid punishment? If I can avoid punishment, then it's okay. Sub-level two, self-interest. What's in it for me? What they're telling us these days, the experts, is that we are becoming less mature. We're not growing up, we're growing younger in our moral reasoning. Well, we could talk about society all day long. The really important question is, where are we? Where are we in our moral reasoning? I'm going to invite you to think about that a little bit. Think about a recent moral dilemma you had and how you worked it through. What was the level of your reasoning? Was it just, am I going to get caught? Was it, is there a reward for me if I do the right thing? Hopefully we're somewhere towards the top of the scale. But the good news today is that we have more than six levels to ascend. There is that seventh level where we become a new creation. You know, this is really, really important for us, especially as Orthodox Christians. 
The Orthodox Church is jam-packed with what we could call the thou shalt nots and the thou shalts. Of course, thou shalt not all the commandments. Then your priest gets up in front and he says, thou shalt not come to liturgy late. Thou shalt not skip when it's time for your confession. Thou shalt go to confession. Thou shalt go to all these extra services. Thou shalt fast. We put on so many things not to do and so many things to do. And here's the danger. If we hear all of that from lower levels of moral reasoning, then the church is some sort of anchor on us. It weighs on us. Ah, oh, more guilt, more fundraisers, more things we have to give. Money, money, money. Why do we think that? Not because the church isn't doing the church's job of being the light of the world. Because we're stuck in lower levels of moral reasoning. So today the message of both the epistle and the gospel is we don't have to be stuck. We're not even called just to improve ourselves and get a little better. We are called, and in fact, we are invited to become a new creation. Something new, something that hasn't been before. And you know, every time we come to church, at the very center of where we look, we see the two prime examples. To the right of every set of world doors is the icon of Christ. To the left of every set of world doors is the icon of the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary. Hopefully you have a prayer corner in your house. And if you do and it's set up effectively, you're going to have those same two icons right there. And hopefully when you travel for business or wherever you go, you take what we call a diptych, those folding icons. Whose icons are on them? Christ and the Virgin Mary. Why? Because they are the architects. They are the archetypes of what it means to be a new creation. We're now preparing in this Feast of Advent for the coming of Christ. And we see Him born in the manger in Bethlehem, wrapped in the swaddling clothes because He's come here to die. Not just for Himself, for us. He becomes the new man. We see Him in His icon. You don't see emotion. You see beyond emotion. You see stability. You see peace. You see single-mindedness. And if you look carefully, you'll see love, joy, and peace in all those gifts of God. He's an example for us of what a new creation looks like. But we might say to ourselves, well, of course, He's the Son of God. Of course He's going to have all that. What about us? We're not the Son of God. Then we look to the left. And you see the Theotokos. She who at the age of three, as we're going to celebrate this coming Wednesday night, at three years of age is presented to the temple. Think how fearful our kids are. Sometimes when we're young teenagers, we don't want to let go of our parents. I think about our kids going off to camp for the first time. All those nerves. At three years of age, they presented her to the temple, and she scrambled up those steps, went into the temple, and never looked back. And only grew from there to the point to which an angel would appear to her. An angel would come to her, perhaps frightening enough right there. That's why they always have to say, don't be afraid when they show up. And would tell her, you are going to bear the Son of God. And she says, let it be done to me according to thy word. That's a new creation. So we have no excuse that we don't know what new creations look like. And we think, well, of course, it's Christ, of course, it's His mother. Look all around you. The saints, the cloud of witnesses around us, testify to what it means to be a new creation. How do we get there? It's old news. Things you've heard before. Prayer. Fasting, almsgiving, all of this takes us from what we were and could stick with if we're not careful and we don't work hard. And they open us up to be the new creation God is trying to make us be. This defines our life, my brothers and sisters. We were baptized into a new creation. 
That's why we go under the water. We die before we rise again into newness of life. That's why when we line up as we're going to in just a few moments to receive Holy Communion, it's Christ's shed blood and broken body that we take into ourselves. We don't just look at it and walk away. We open our mouths, we receive it into ourselves so that His blood courses through our veins and His flesh becomes our flesh. And when we've strayed from that path of being a new creation, the church invites us to come back. Come back and restore the newness of our baptism through the sacrament of holy confession. The challenge, or rather the opportunity, to be a new creation really gives us two choices. We can stay among those lower levels of reasoning, even sometimes doing the right thing, maybe often doing the right thing, but for the wrong reason. And what does it get us? Bitterness, anger, grumpiness. Why? Because those are all on this side of being a new creation. Our old life doesn't fit in the new. And the new life can't fit in the old. And if we don't take that step to be a new creation, then even the right things do the wrong things for us. We just get more and more and more bitter. Because you can't put old wine into new wineskins. The other choice is, of course, the better one. It's to grow up. We all need to grow up. Reason our decisions more than just, can I get away with it? Who's going to see me? What's it going to do for me? Not even what's it going to do for the rest of the world. What's it going to do because who I am as the new creation in Jesus Christ? Not an easy life. Not at all. But it's a joyful life amidst all the struggle. Even in the heart of our deepest struggle in the midst of a Lenten period, there's joy. Because we accept who we are as a new creation, being refashioned in the image of Christ. That's our choice today. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not going to tell you, encourage you, to, I'm going to encourage you to think about how we make the decisions and what we do. And I invite all of us to listen to the Word of God we heard this morning in both the Epistle and the Gospel. We've been invited to be a new creation. That new creation was what was intended for us from the very beginning in paradise. That's what's waiting for us. So let's grow up. Let's be the new creation we were made to be and let's take our place that God has intended for us in the midst of His perfect kingdom. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.